Mr. Speaker, as my NDP colleagues have repeatedly stated, our party favours international trade agreements that are fair and reciprocal. During my tenure in this place, we've supported several that met these conditions. The previous government was quick to sign any agreement just to sign so-called free trade agreements. The current government promised better deals, but instead has signed off in the Conservative negotiated deal with Europe, despite the unaddressed concerns expressed by many Canadians. As has been mentioned, changes to intellectual property rules will cause drug prices to skyrocket. Considering our aging population, mounting household debt, and the number of Canadians, in particular seniors, already struggling to pay for food, rent, men, rent and medicines, this deal will seriously impact affordability. The government should have at least assessed and addressed this impact in advance of signing, particularly since it appears PharmaCare is missing from this government's priority list for additional health transfers. CETA also poses significant impacts to Alberta's agriculture and agri-food sectors. In particular, concerns have been expressed by our dairy and dairy processing sectors. While most attention has been focused on the impacts to the Quebec dairy sector, Alberta dairy will also be impacted. We are told that Canadian manufacturing standards combined with generous subsidies for European producers make it almost impossible for our cheesemakers to compete, at least to compete fairly. This government promised dairy farmers and processors a total of $350 million investment fund over four years to help them modernize their operations and increase their productivity and efficiency, as well as diversify their range of products in order to capitalize on new European markets. This is far less than the Conservatives promised, unfortunately. I'm deeply proud of the contribution of our, to our economy by our Alberta dairy farmers, and I meet regularly with them and uh, try to address their concerns. One incredible multi-generational farm family, the Bococks, operated a dairy operation since their immigration from Ireland in 1921. They not only introduced many beneficial innovations for sustainable farming, on retirement they donated 777 acres of their operation to the University of Alberta for dairy research. Their contribution has been recognized by the Dairy Industry Achievement Award. It's farm families like the Bococks who are being impacted. While the program will, for the most part, benefit the largest processors, the amount is far from adequate, as has been shared often in the House on debate of this bill. These pioneers and the other Canadian dairy families and the processors who continue to produce fine product should be factored first in considering any potential impacts of trade deals. While Alberta dairy producers and processors are grateful some compensation is being promised, they are only matching funds and limited to modernization investments. This support will be unavailable to those who have already invested in changes, and yet they may still be impacted. Alberta cheesemakers estimate a loss of 17,000 tons in cheese sales. They are concerned if the promised funds are to be allocated to producers and processors, or will they be partly eaten up by administration of the fund? Secondly, they have expressed concern about how quickly the money will flow as the need to get out ahead of anticipated changes to the market. CETA, I am told, could also be pro problematic to our pork and beef industries. Although they potentially will benefit, there are European regulatory obstacles that must be addressed. I wish to reiterate, Mr. Speaker, concerns expressed by many about this government's insistence on retaining the investor state provisions. Shifting authority to an independent court to rule on corporate complaints of what they deem unfair environmental or health provisions is reprehensible, certainly in a country that believes in rule of law. Surely such a measure contradicts the very principles this government claims to espouse, that the financial interests of investors should not be permitted to supersede the public interest, including environmental protections. Successful industrial state um, investor claims under the trade deals have already created regulatory chill and as some of my colleagues have shared we have lost most of those cases brought against our country by investors. But Mr. Speaker, it's the continued erosion of environmental protection prevailing over trade deals that troubles me the most. In the mid-1990s when the NAFTA or North American Free Trade Agreement was entered into between Canada, United States and Mexico 
Canada also signed on to several side agreements. One of those is the North American Agreement on Environmental Cooperation. Every trade deal since has strayed from those foundational principles and institutions, including provision for independent assessment and reporting on the party's adherence to the environmental commitments. Yet there are vague mentions of environment in CETA. Yes, there are vague mentions of environment in CETA, but the measures fall far short of the bar set under the North American Agreement on Environmental Cooperation. Absent, Mr. Speaker, is any independent environmental secretariat or Council of Environment Ministers to monitor and act on complaints of failed environmental enforcement or delivery on public rights of engagement in decisions that place economic considerations ahead of the environment. In place of these credible mechanisms, the parties will merely appoint some officer as a contact point, presumably low within their respective bureaucracies. There is no provision for independent assessment and reporting. Gone is the commitment to prepare and make public a State of the Environment report, a matter that has been raised to me a number of times in the last few weeks. Whatever happened to the State of Environment reports? Gone is commitment to ensure public notice and right to comment in advance of any decision impacting the environment, including trade deals, including agreements negotiated between the provinces, territories, and the federal government on climate. Gone is the framework for effective environmental enforcement. That is, these are necessary to hold this government accountable. And finally, what will be the effect on Canadian local job creation through the burgeoning Canadian renewable energy and energy efficiency sectors of Article 24.9? It requires removals of any obstacles to investments in goods and services for renewable energy, goods, and related services. Will there be barriers to local hiring and incentives? Has the government even examined that? Thank you, Mr. Speaker.